Hello, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's Streaming Only History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. All six episodes of the first season of our new podcast, Speaking of Mississippi, have been posted. The topics covered are the state's 1878 yellow fever epidemic, the Civil War siege of Jackson, Mississippi's Union veterans, the desegregation of Jackson's public swimming pools, a survey of the documentary films of Wilma Mosley Clopton, and the Jackson State shootings. You can find links to the episodes on the department's website or wherever you get your podcasts. I hope you'll join us next week for History is Lunch when Maddie Codling will discuss the recently reissued Horn Island Logs of Walter Anderson. Today, we're delighted to have Edward Onichi with us to present Liberating the Territory, Activism, Repression, and the Republic of New Africa. Edward Onichi is an Associate Professor of History and African American and Africana Studies at Ursinus College. He earned his BA in History from Virginia State University and his MA and PhD in History from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Onichi's book, Free the Land, the Republic of New Africa, and the Pursuit of a Black Nation State, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2020. Ed will join us via Zoom from his office at Ursinus College. Please ask your questions in the comments section of this video. We'll ask those of Ed at the appropriate time. And now, welcome Ed Onichi. Thanks so much, Chris. And thanks to everyone at the MDAH, not only for hosting me today, but also for the assistance that various staff provided me when I was conducting my research that is allowing me to do this, um, this, this presentation today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get my PowerPoint up and you should be able to see that now. By way of introduction, I'd actually like to introduce and discuss the colors that you all are seeing to the left of this screen. The order and meaning of the Republic of New Africa, um, of the Republic of New Africa's green, red, and black representative flag illuminates some features of New African thought that distinguish its ideas and objectives from other black power era formations. According to the article, the flag and of our nation, the color black is on the bottom to symbolize the political and economic positions of African people throughout the world. Green takes up the top position of this RNA flag because New Africans recognized obtaining land as the most important aspect of their struggle for liberation. Only by gaining land and independence could New Africans expect to help rearrange the economic conditions that made African people among some of the poorest in the world. Finally, the thin red stripe in the middle stands in for the blood of people who must secure land using every available tool and tactic, although New Africans hope to lose, quote, as little black blood as possible, end quote, in pursuit of their goal. The goal, of course, was full independence and statehood. During the 1960s and 1970s, various African-American activists articulated varying notions of, quote, unquote, separatism. Specifically and more accurately, individuals and organizations sought to self sought self determination in a variety of ways, including through control over their children's education, advocacy of for black political empowerment, rethinking the history and meaning of the black religious experience, and the development of African inspired cultural practices. Although important initiatives that help fortify African American sense of self and political commitments none put forth a strong vision of black statehood. Instead, they sought survival, cultural revitalization, and political empowerment within a more egalitarian, though sometimes revolutionized American state. New Africans, on the other hand, understood self-determination as choosing where to place their consent of citizenship. Beginning during the final weekend in March in 1968, they advocated for the creation of an independent black nation state that stood apart from the legal and political jurisdiction of the United States of America. 
Their effort focused on securing control of the states of Georgia, Louisiana, South Carolina, Alabama, and of course, Mississippi. At the time, New Africans viewed themselves as one of many nations, not an American minority group, participating in a global effort to end worldwide white supremacy and to win independence for colonized peoples. Their ideas added an alternative option to the nationalist thinking of the Black Power era and beyond. The attempts and outcomes of people's endeavors to live according to these ideas will be the focus of my presentation today. And so first, what I'll do just by way of overview, I'll tell some of the early history of the New African independence movement. In doing so, I'll explain some of the major goals and discuss some of the ideas that are important for this, um, this, this presentation. In my book, I'm interested in, broadly speaking, in how people in the movement negotiated their political goals with their everyday lives. Using that same framework, I'll explain today why some focus their energies organizing in Mississippi and how run-ins with local and federal law enforcement impacted their daily lives, but also the movement. Although we tend to give significant attention to spectacular instances of violence, that's actually not all that matters in activists' everyday lives. So to begin to move us into some of the less spectacular everyday aspects of being a movement activist, I'll spend some time discussing why name choices were important to some New Africans. And I'll close by mentioning some of the modern day New African independence activism that is taking place. So this story begins with Milton and Richard Henry. Milton was a well-respected Tuskegee Airman who was dishonorably discharged for refusing to accept segregation in the military. After the war, he graduated from Lincoln University, meeting and befriending people who would serve in Kwame Nkrumah's government along the way. He then graduated from Yale Law School um, and wanted to take the bar in his home state of Pennsylvania, but decided to take it in Pontiac, Michigan instead because he was warned that he would not be able to use his legal expertise to fight for civil rights in Pennsylvania. So he went on over to Detroit where he felt like he had more opportunities. Milton became a member of the Pontiac City Commission, um, an elected official, but he felt stifled. As the only African-American on the commission, he could not make decisions that he felt would benefit black people. He compared his experience with what he saw when he visited Ghana and, and was able to experience black political power in action. The contrast left a lasting impression. His younger brother, Richard, followed him to Detroit. There, Richard was a journalist and a technical writer, as well as a community organizer. And together, among other things, they created a group called the Group on Advanced Leadership. This Group on Advanced Leadership, or GOAL, um, it was a civil rights organization that advocated for things like the end of gentrification, the end of police brutality, and one of my favorite things, because I love food, they wanted to get Black-owned food products in grocery stores, and uh, if you look through their, their materials, one of those items was barbecue sauce. That makes me happy. But um, more important for this presentation, they hosted a grassroots leadership conference in November 1963. And the reason why that's important is because they invited Malcolm X, the minister from the Nation of Islam, who by that time was uh, had a relationship with Milton Henry. They, they traveled together and things of that nature. They invited him to that conference to give a keynote speech. That keynote speech we now know as the message to the grassroots. And in that speech, one of the things that Malcolm X does is he contrasts what he calls the Negro Revolution from the Black Revolution. And by calling upon the examples of the US, the French, the Russian, and other, the Haitian and other revolutions, he reminds us that revolutions are two things. One, they're about land. Second, they're bloody. And so that speech confirmed in some ways for the Obadelli brothers what they thought they were seeing already, which was some of the limitations of fighting for civil rights as opposed to human rights, for fighting for 
inclusion in somebody else's government instead of fighting to create their own government. So um, as we know, Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965. And in the wake of his death, Milton and Richard Henry changed their names to Gaidi and Imario Badelli, respectively. They created an organization that they called the Malcolm X Society. And that Malcolm X Society's goal was to host a conference that would bring a variety of Black activists together to talk about what government would look like, a Black government would look like for Black people. Uh, they were able to pull this together on that final weekend of March in 1968, and that became known as the Black Government Convention. So in addition to the Obadeli brothers, Highly revered reparations activist, Queen Mother Adi Moore attended that meeting. And it's important that she attended because of her own background. It, among other things, um, I, I said that she was a revered reparations activist. She also was a Garveyite and she was a former member of the Communist Party. And one of the things that um, she's known for within the new African independence movement is by actually kind of setting it in motion by convincing Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X that an independent nation was essential to black liberation. Her presence therefore lent the founding convention a lot of legitimacy and she confirmed her willingness to free the land as, as folks would start to say, when she became the first signer of a declaration of independence of the, the New African Declaration of Independence on March 31st of 1968. Now, next to Queen Mother Moore, I have a picture of Betty Shabazz, who also participated in the convention that the Obadelli brothers called for. As the widow of the movement's patron saint, Malik Shabazz or Malcolm X, her presentation lent the gathering significant support. To these and hundreds of other men and women who were eager to achieve independence, America's various rights acts, executive orders, job bills, and increasing presence of Black elected officials were actually band-aids at best for deep and crippling injustices that they believed could only be resolved if certain conditions were met. Those conditions included statehood and independence, reparations for historic injustice, and contemporary oppression and a global realignment of power based on the destruction of white supremacy and capitalism. The independence of the RNA would, in their estimation, join the global uprising against European and American dominance, but from within the belly of the beast, a position many thought would lead to the automatic removal of Western control over many economically and politically dependent countries and colonies. So it was based on people like uh, the Obadelli brothers, Queen Mother Moore, Betty Shabazz, is based on these folks' lived experiences as veteran activists, as former military servicemen, and actually sometimes current military servicemen, domestic and factory workers, elected officials, lynching witnesses and survivors, and as immediately as immediate uh, descendants of ens the enslaved that drove over 100 people to declare their dedication to the independent struggle over that, that weekend of the conference. And actually, before I move on, I do wanna just bring everyone's attention to, I, I have a little bit of wording here from the RNA Declaration of Independence that supports some of the goals that I said were important First up here, ours is a revolution against oppression, our own oppression, and that of all people in the world, and that is a revolution for a better life. Again, they understood themselves as, an, as a, a captive African nation within the US, and they reasoned that they were in solidarity with these, with these other uh, captive peoples, you know, colonies who were struggling for independence. And what's also important here um, is, is the second statement, 
We, the undersigned, pledge without reservation ourselves, our talents, and our worldly goods to this new African independence movement. I bring that up because one of the concepts that I use in my larger research is this term lifestyle politics, which I use to get at how people negotiate their everyday lives and their lived experiences with their ideology and political practices. And I'll tease out what that looked like just a little bit in this presentation. And another statement that helps us think about that actually comes from the New African Oath for the fruition of Black power, for the triumph of Black nationhood. I pledge to the Republic of New Africa to the building of a better people in a better world. And here's the important part, my total devotion, my total resources, and the total power of my mortal life. And so uh, for the next few slides, we'll get a little glimpse of what that might have looked like for these folks. So although more the Obadelli brothers and a few others developed the ideas, the, uh, what they call the New African political science that helped start the movement, Imari Obadelli would, by the early 1970s, become the movement's chief theorist, publishing books, pamphlets, and journal articles that explain the movement's ideas as he labored beside Cadre who attempted to, as it says here, to free the land, beginning with the areas in and around Jackson, Mississippi. And so skipping, so we had the founding convention, I'll skip just a little bit to uh, early 1970. Uh, immediately after the founding convention, Detroit remained the base of PGRNA organizing. However, in 1970, Mario Bedelli gained control over the provisional government and he decided to move south. First, he headed to New Orleans, but a few months later, he established a headquarters in Jackson, Mississippi. And this led up to the March 1971 land dedication in Bolton, where according to Chokwe Lumumba, the Free the Land slogan originated. It also came with some rising tensions between New Africans, local officials, and the Ku Klux Klan. So with the presumed propensity for violence, according to some of the local media, not least because of the shootout involving New Africans and Detroit police at New Bethel Baptist Church in 1969, RNA work posed a novel kind of threat to the United States at the local, state, and federal levels. In Mississippi specifically, only about 30 New Africans worked regularly with the Jackson headquarters. And Mario Bedelli tried to make, and I'm paraphrasing here, he tried to make it perfectly clear to local officials that he and his people, they were there to work in peace. Yet, because New Africans attempted to match their practice with the language of revolution and nation building, they challenged U.S. governing bodies' ability to exercise authority over New Africans. For that reason, it comes to no surprise that local officials and the FBI sustained efforts to monitor and disrupt RNA activity. Those efforts led to the August 18, 1971 raids on the RNA headquarters and residents, incur incursions that challenged New Africans' ability to exercise self-determination and unbind themselves from the United States. The gunfire that would affect the course of RNA organizing for the remainder of that decade burst from their residence at 1138 Lewis Street at approximately 6.30 a.m. On that warm sunny morning, four of the seven New Africans who were present responded to tear gas canisters crashing through the walls of their residence with rifle fire. As they engaged in a decisive battle with the police and FBI in what they considered to be a desperate attempt to preserve their own lives, three others searched in vain for a safe route of escape. After about 20 minutes of shooting and the fa fatal wounding of one police officer, the seven surrendered. Half naked and handcuffed, the men and women were marched down Lewis Street by their police escorts. Nearby at 1320 Lynch Street, Obadelli and three others surrendered to police and federal agents who had surrounded their office. Not one bullet exited a New African's agent's or police officer's gun. However, the circumstances of that interaction were no more peaceful than the episode that occurred several blocks away. One by one, each person walked slowly from the residence with raised hands. 
At a certain point, law enforcement ordered them to lay face down on the morning concrete where they were bound and thoroughly searched. The new Africans from Lynch Street later reported receiving beatings once in police custody. These arrests solidified the state of Mississippi's victory in their effort to prevent the, the captive Black nation from achieving independence. In addition to capturing the PGRNA president, that win diverted many resources away from the nation building project so that it could go toward the legal defense efforts of the RNA 11, as they were then called, demonstrating the organizational and personal costs some social movement activists paid as they worked toward their goals. New Africans' entanglement in the shootout brought them charges ranging from murder and levy of war against the state of Mississippi to possession of stolen property. Juries found three RNA activists guilty of murder, and Obadeli was convicted of conspiracy to commit, commit offenses of assault and of unlawful possessing unregistered firearms. Those convictions stand to this day. What I find interesting here is that in a pretrial attempt to protect the RNA 11, their defense lawyers unsuccessfully filed an Article III challenge to the U.S. jurisdiction over African people in North America. This motion argued that the RNA is a nation separate from, though held captive by, the United States of America. The RNA and their lawyers attempted to articulate to their audience a theory that had long been marginalized by the US government and, Afri and even African Americans who never fully subscribed to the idea that they remained members of a quote unquote captive nation. The raid on the RNA headquarters, the charges brought against the RNA 11, and the fact that the state government indicted and convicted New Africans as US citizens all magnified a duality New Africans faced in their self-positioning as RNA citizens, but also as captives under US sovereignty. For New Africans, these happenings also signaled the outright refusal of the US government to consider the legality of what they called paper citizenship. And, and just to unpack this a little bit, paper citizenship, according to Obadeli, Imari Obadeli, Gaidi Obadeli, and others, um, was the idea that their ancestors were not given a choice as to whether they wanted to be US citizens, okay? Uh, so as enslaved people, they were forced to be in, in the United States with the 13th Amendment being passed, Obadeli, the Obadelis argued they then were a freed nation. And at that point, they should have had some time to meet amongst themselves, educate themselves about what their various possibilities were as a freed but stateless people. And they argued that they should have, there should have been several choices. One choice would to be to accept U.S. citizenship. Another choice would be to um, to, to immigrate to another already established nation. And, you know, at the time there was some talk of black people going to Haiti. There also were people who were already had already established a government in Liberia. So that type of option. Another option would have been to um, have their own government and to have their own land. And in the absence of these choices, they considered the Obadelis and others considered the 14th Amendment to be an imposition, whereas it should have been an offer that was made, right? An offer that would have been one choice out of several. So in addition, even with that 14th Amendment in place, African people in the US never received the full rights and protections that the amendment was supposed to guarantee. Therefore, they were US citizens on paper only. So finally, the charges and convictions demonstrate a fundamental problem with New Africans' project to construct their own citizenship. As a selectively imposed or ardently defended concept, citizenship only mattered as much as the forces in power dictated. Therefore, conscious New Africans' uh, quote-unquote dual citizenship demonstrates the unbalanced personal group application of such ideals, as well as the uneven persecution they face because of their reconceptualization of national belonging. 
The conflict in Jackson, like other violent encounters between activists and police, came at significant personal and political costs. The consequence of such battles included the loss of life and the injury of New Africans, police officers, and FBI agents, along with others. They included New Africans' imprisonment, the destruction of property uh, that was in the hands of either activists or local community members, and the stagnation of RNA growth and development, not to mention contributing to the general perception of New Africans as violent criminals. In many ways, the US government achieved its objectives through its strategy of surveillance and repression. However, their program did not crush the PGRNA or the, or the New African independence movement. It has not yet won completely the war um, to, to take them out. Some citizens continue pursuing independence from behind the walls of prisons across the United States. Those who remained on the outside utilized the images of their imprisoned comrades to organize and mobilize for New African uh, liberation. And so if you take a look at this image here, which comes from the New African Journal, I, I like to use this to help, I guess, give a pictorial representation of how people understood captivity, whether it be because people were literally in prison or because they understood themselves as part of a captive nation. And so this image in some way in some ways represents the claims that they were being held captive, yet struggling against their captivity. Um, and there's a geographer whose name is Priscilla McCutcheon who uses this concept of landscapes of liberation. And I, I think that this image would help us really get a, a pictorial representation of, of what that concept is about. And, McCutcheon's analysis, representations like this one reframe locales of tragedy as sites of resilience and triumph. And if we think about the tragedy aspect, we can think about slavery, right? There's the theft of people's bodies and labor. There was the forced coercion, um, uh, the, the coercion to labor, even after slavery, there was lynching, there was convict leasing, and there was what we all, what we call now the prison industrial complex. But there's also a lot of revolutionary potential or triumph that we can read into this image. And so if we think about these, the states that are represented here as the land of freedom fighters, right? People such as Harriet Tubman and Denmark Vesey and thousands upon thousands of unnamed people who fought against slavery, um, who resisted segregation and economic oppression, and who found through all of it, multiple ways to maintain their human dignity through severe conditions, then we can start to see the potential. And specifically, just going back to the image itself, that potential is in the fact that these bars right here are broken, right? And people are breaking free, those five states free from behind those prison bars. Although the figures in this image all appear to be carrying tools of their liberation, the weaponry, that New Africans, like many other activists employed, were not limited just to hardware. In fact, ideology and culture have been two of the most vital aspects of revolutionary struggle. In my conception of lifestyle politics, one specific realm that I used to better understand this is through New African name choices. So, I think everybody knows this gentleman right here, well-known and widely respected New African Chokwe Lumumba began his association with the PGRNA in 1969. It was then that he decided to take on an African name to represent his politics. He explained that Chokwe means hunter and it was the name of quote, an African nation which existed during the slave trade, end quote. Um, Lumumba means gifted and for him, it was inspired by Patrice Lumumba, the assassinated leader who helped the Democratic Republic of Congo transition to independence. Taken together, one may translate Chokwe Lumumba as a gifted hunter, but the name, and these are his words, also represents the nation and the brother that had important roles in our liberation struggle against white supremacy and for independence, end quote. 
Like the inspiration behind his name, this new African ancestor demonstrated skillful leadership and fervent resistance from 1969 until his unexpected death in 2014. In that time, he served the PGRNA as vice president and acting president. He played a critical role from 1973 to 1979 in, hope, in helping fund RNA activities, leading to efforts to make the provisional government more visible within and accountable to Black communities, helping organize national and international demonstrations against human rights abuses, and to make visible new African political prisoners and prisoners of war. In the early 1980s, and, and to be exact, May 19, 1984, Lumumba co-founded the New African People's Organization, which birthed the Malcolm X grassroots movement, uh, and the Malcolm X grassroots movement came about in 1990, all while paying, playing a key intellectual and organizational role in the founding of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. It's a lot. <laughs> he was busy. So the Malcolm X grassroots movement created Cooperation Jackson, a project that ran him for Jackson City Council and eventually for mayor. And he was only a couple months into his mayorship when he died. And as we know, his son, Chokwe Antar Lumumba, is now the mayor of Jackson. So this is a partial list. And I use it not to laud his activism per se, although his commitment to his beliefs is indeed impressive. Instead, this listing is important because it makes clear how his 1969 name change signaled an important turning point in his life. It was the moment when he embraced his positionality and identity as a new African revolutionary. His name became an outward display of his commitment, his fears, his hopes, and his realization that his goals were in direct contrast to those of one of the most powerful nations on the face of the planet. And so, I use it also to make clear that there's a political genealogy and legacy here that we too often overlook in our, in our discussions of black politics. And, um, you know, so these are some themes that I, again, I get into in my larger book project, but I wanna move on to somebody else. So suffice it to say that in, in my analysis, he lived up to the name and he continues, even uh, though he has now passed on to, to be an example of how the embrace of a name can both signal one's political ambitions, but can also be used to help fuel those ambitions over time. And, and he was able to be, he was pretty consistent over a couple, over, over a few decades. So while Lumumba felt it was necessary to abandon his quote unquote slave name in favor of an African one. Another former PGRNA leader, Marilyn Preston Kellingham, refused to get rid of her birth name. She opined that, quote, Marilyn is a derivative of Mary, and my mother's name was Mary. And she changed the Y to I and added Lynn. She's an African warrior, and I'm named after her. And I guess if Jesus was black, then I guess his mother. Mary would have had to be too, end quote. Killingham's justification for holding on to her given name is significant because it highlights the reasoning of activists who valued the inheritance of markers that they found significant despite being associated with their former slave masters. Killingham considered her mother an African warrior whose name she proudly bore. Further, as a devout Christian, she associated the name Mary with a key figure in her faith. Even though the PGRNA never mandated that New Africans shed their slave names, Killingham explained that she did sometimes have to defend her decision to keep hers. In a culture that sought to disassociate itself from any vestiges of oppression, people probably placed great pressure on her and others to take on African designations. Killingham's possession of an African name uh, also stands out as significant. Uh, the, the name of an African warrior also stands out as significant because her inheritance seemed to contradict what some perceived as the prevailing gender conventions of the time. Um, and so if you've read Asada Shakur, you may remember that in her autobiography, she, she talks about naming to some degree. She says that women's names weren't like men's names. Um, men's names were supposed to uh, uh, 
they're supposed to give men these characteristics such as bravery, being a war a warrior, being a man of iron, those types of things. And then she contrasted that with what she saw as the conventions around women's names. And so, you know, women um, would use names like Amina, Marini, which must respectively mean peaceful and charming, which may to some degree support Asada's assertion. In addition, some women's appellations denoted generally heteronormative features of femininity, such as being a mother or wife. However, at least some new African women adopted and gave their children strong names, such as Asantawa, Nefertiti, and Zynga, designations shared by warriors and rulers. Yet the dominant gender conventions persisted insofar as, at least in what I've seen, more men were likely to take on warrior names. And so those associated with soldiers and hunters, including Balagoon, Shaka, as well as Kamau, Odinga, these types of names did enjoy quite a bit of prominence based on the surveys of names I've been able to see from the literature and the primary documents that I've had access to. Names in these cases are neither cosmetic nor based on simple notions about European or African descendants. Instead, they represent a larger attempt amongst New Africans to make meaningful decisions based on broader notions of Pan-African nationalism and their US-based independence movement. Although these two, uh, Chokwe Lumumba and Marilyn Killingham, um, did not agree about what names to use, they made their personal choices based on how they understood themselves within the collective effort to pursue common political objectives. This became most clear in their vehement promotion of the group designation New African, which they chose above African, Black, Afro, or African American, and especially as opposed to Negro, which, which by the 1960s, a lot of people didn't like. Regardless of whether they took on or avoided African names as individuals, they rationalized their choices using the goals which were branded in that group label. And there, I should say also that they justified their reasoning in ways that were consistent with the broader um, ideology they were working within, what um, they called new African political science. So those are just a couple of ways that I talk about the lived experience of being an activist. Um, I think that it's important that we understand, I just want to kind of reiterate, I guess, that typically when we do these histories, we're attracted to, you know, the spectacular aspects of the movement. We're attracted to people with guns standing up with raised fists, you know, challenging whatever the symbol of the state is at the time. And that's all important. But what I think is as important, if not more important, is what are people doing during all those other moments, right? When they're not out there in front of the cameras, when they're not um, fighting legal battles or whatever they have to do. And what they're doing is actually living. They're actually trying to put their ideas into practice through just their everyday lives. And that's something that um, I hope we can all take away from not just the history of the New African Independence Movement, but any scholarship or, or news story, whatever it is about activism that we consume, we should think about how the human beings behind the headlines and the images, how they actually live on a daily basis, because that's, that's really important. And that's where the cultural change, the, and the, uh, the cultural change occurs and where the ideology is put into practice and evolves over time because of how it's put in practice. And so just to wrap this up, um, I think it's important also that we recognize that the PGRNA was not crushed in 1971 or 72. Um, instead, people continued to be active, right? I talked about Chokwe Lumumba. One of the things that I didn't mention explicitly is that in 1973, he was working with a number of different Black Power Era organizations to pay attention to um, the political prisoners that were in abundance by 1973 
because of government repression. And that, that action, the way that he and others organized, set the foundation for what we now see in the prison abolitionist circles and some of the calls to defund the police and in the everyday work that people are doing to communicate with people in prison, to advocate for better prison conditions, and to bring people who have been incarcerated because of their political beliefs and practices home, get them out of prison. And so um, the, the movement does continue. The PGRNA is still around. They just had what would be their Oh, I'm a historian and my math sometimes is bad. It would be their 53rd anniversary, I believe, if I got the math right. Um, there's also, I mentioned the New African People's Organization, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. There's also um, a collective called Rebuild and you can do an internet search for any of these groups and organizations and you can find that they're still putting information out there they're still active in their communities and they're doing things in a number of different forums, including using popular culture, right? So last August, um, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement teamed up with the Movement for Black Lives to host a Black August hip hop concert. And it's through this type of work that we see the legacy of the 1968 um, Black Government Convention and we see how people learned from, recovered from, and tried to even build upon some of the losses, such as what occurred in 1971 in Jackson and other spaces. So with that said, um, I'd love to take some questions. I greatly appreciate that you uh, tuned in today and I'll turn it back over to Chris. Thanks so much. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. There are indeed questions. The first comes from Deirdre Payne. What about Jackson, Mississippi contributed to it being chosen as the site rather than the original focus of Louisiana? Um, okay, so I think for the event, there was a map that uh, has the five states that they focused on, but then had a shaded area that runs along the Mississippi River. That is what people like Omari Obadeli identified as the Cush District. And they identified that area as being really important to organizing for a couple of reasons. One, in terms of being able to um, organize people, those are some of the blackest counties in, in the South in terms of the people, right? So they said, let's go where we have the highest concentrations of people and let's organize those folks instead of trying to just import a bunch of people from outside, right? Um, another reason is about, uh, if I understand stand this correctly, another reason was about agriculture and commerce. It was a good area because it's along a body of water and because it has some fertile ground for producing agriculture to actually be able to sustain people as they're building an economy. And um, those would be the main reasons for why Jackson, and yeah, Jackson is actually outside of the Kush district, but um, it, it is an urban center, a majority of black city, and it was one of the places that they thought would be best to, to get started. Shane Peterson asks if it's fair to think of Mississippi as the American Congo. Is it fair to, I'm sorry, can you say that again? To think of Mississippi as the American Congo. I know uh, at least one scholar, Nan E. Woodruff does. Um, in her book, she compares some, uh, she compares the labor relations and the violence that was needed in order to preserve white supremacy and to, to preserve those labor relations to the, the Belgian Congo. Um, so I do think that there's some support for that. I personally always try to remind people that what happened in the Belgian Congo actually came after what was happening in the United States of America. And so we could, out, we could flip that 
in what ways did Mississippi, uh, South Carolina, New York, New Hampshire, and, and I, uh, uh, Rhode Island, which also were central to the to international slave trade, in what ways did these become models for places like the Belgian Congo when it got established? Yeah. You spoke earlier about the lack of published work on the Republic of New Africa. What primary sources were you able to access in your research for your book, and who were you able to conduct interviews with? I'm so glad you asked that question. So I'll start by again thanking the Mississippi Department of Archives and History uh, because I actually spent several days there accessing the, the Republic of New Africa collection, but also digging into the local newspapers, right? Those became very important, especially as I was just trying to get a sense of how were people thinking about new Africans uh, establishing a headquarters in Mississippi, what was some of the, the mainstream discourse about the shootout in 1971 and, and things of that nature. In addition to that, I was able to go to Tougaloo and access student papers, which, which was very useful in trying to understand again what some of the local community thought and how young people were responding. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in Detroit also accessing. So, so to make this short, because I'll get excited and tell you all the documents I looked at, <laughs> um, to, to, I was able to access a number of primary source documents at a number of different official collections. I also was able to establish relationships with some people who now are mentors, luckily for me, with people who are in the movement. And they not only allowed me to interview them and, and really understand what the personal experience was, right? Chokle Mumba was one of the first ones to, to welcome me and, and say, yeah, let's talk and give me documents. But, and that, that's actually the second part. They also gave me access to documents that weren't in the archives. Right. Um, and that's really, really important because uh, they just, they have things that give a different perspective, right? There, there's what the MDAH has, which is very useful. Then there's some of the background stuff that only the humans who are involved right. continue to have. Um, the final thing was participant observation. Um, the I think third to the last image that I showed was actually from New African Nation Day. I've, I've attended several of those. Um, I was able to meet people, get a feel. I'm, a, you know, I'm an outsider. I came to this because I was interested in research, and so it gave me an opportunity not just to learn from people about the history, but to really get a sense of of the culture, since that's what I'm interested in. How do people actually live according to these I ideals? Right. And so that also was very important. In your book, you noted that. Um some of the original RNA documents were lost in the 1969 New Bethel shooting. What, what, was, what was lost in that? The original Declaration of Independence. Hmm. Um, yeah, when people found out, when people from the movement found out what I was doing, uh, one of the questions that I got a few times was, have you come across the original signed declaration because that was one of the documents that they couldn't recover after that that um that shootout in 1969 Sarah Campbell asks who were the attorneys who represented the Republic of New Africa defendants um you know I, I can't remember the names off the top of my head if you look at Imario Bedelli. So Imario Bedelli wrote the first Free the Land, right? <laughs> the most important Free the Land, yeah. in my opinion. Um, he actually names a lot of the attorneys. I I'm sorry, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, though. Um, Avery Rollins asks if there's any sort of memorial or monument at the original RNA land intended as the beginning. So I assume that means at El Malik and uh, at Bolton. Emily, yeah, in Bolton. Uh, I have not heard about anything of that nature. Um, I, I actually did go out there in 2009, and, and I mean, it just 
you wouldn't know unless somebody told you that they even tried to establish that as their their headquarters. Um, there were several connections between Jackson and Detroit, of course, but one that um, I, I wish you would say a few words about was the Medgar Evers Rifle Club in Detroit. I can tell you what I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the tactics of the era was to establish rifle clubs, right? And and to my my understanding is that this actually comes out of from people like Robert F. Williams and others who were veterans who, when they were trying to protect themselves, get uh, advocate for the right to vote and things of that nature, they had to find legitimized ways to organize self-defense groups. One of the ways to do that is to reach out to the RNA, get that membership, and establish a rifle club. Mm -hmm. That way you can practice, you can access, you can access and acquire the different equipment that you need. And it's all within well-established paths to doing that. It's not out of the norm for anybody, except for the fact that they're, you know, in some places maybe them being African-American would have raised some eyebrows. Um, but the thing with the Medgar Evers Rifle Club in Detroit, um, it, it was very explicitly used to train people who could then be a part of the security and military aspects of the PGRNA. It also was supposed to give uh, everyday people, everyday citizens, some of the training that they needed because the expectation was that, well, everyone, no, there's no luxury of having a distinct, you know, security arm and you know, civilian wing, everyone at any time could be attacked. Therefore, people need to have at least some of the basic training and skills to defend themselves. And so uh, my understanding is that in the various, the various cadres, when they had cadre uh, formations and the various consulates, when they had consulates in the early days, they all had some training uh, that they participated in. Yeah, that makes sense. Robbie Luckett, uh, director of the Margaret Walker Center at JSU, had sent this question ahead of time. He says, I get asked about the RNA and the shootout in Jackson on a relatively regular basis since Margaret Walker Alexander's son was a member and was in the house when the shootings happened. I wonder about the long-term impact of that event on the RNA and in Jackson, and I also wonder about the details of that event and how it was framed or misframed, much like the 1970 Jackson State shootings by the white power structure locally and nationally. Yeah, so to address the first part or the first question about the long-term impact, um, you know, it was pretty devastating from what I could tell. There was quite a bit of momentum that had gone into establishing the new African independence movement that had gone into moving the headquarters and to maintain organization across the country. I mean, really from, from California to New York, to Atlanta, to, to wherever else. Um, and when something as tragic and violent as that occurs, not only do you have to deal with the human cost, you know, people got hurt and people were imprisoned, but then there's also the legal repercussions and the drain that that has on people's resources. So people, instead of trying to acquire land or build some sort of structure, which is what they were trying to do in Bolton, um, instead of doing that, they now have to divert their attention toward defending folks who have pending trials. And so, uh, you know, there, there was significant legal cost. And the fact that Imario Bedelli was arrested and then convicted and had to spend time in and out of prison over the next 12 years, um, that caused a lot of problems at the leadership level. And one of the things that occurred was he, he's, he was the president, but he was incarcerated. And so questions arose about whether or not he could serve his functions as president. He argued that he could, some of his supporters argued that he could, other people, 
including Chokwe Lumumba um, and Dara Abu Bukhari and, and a host of other folks, they thought otherwise. And so that caused a lot of tension. And so the, again, first you're diverting resources and time and energy toward legal defense. Now, because there's this, this tension about what to do with the leadership, you're devoting um, a lot of energy toward trying to resolve that. And, and it took several years for them to resolve that and led to what was one of the reasons why the New African uh, People's Organization formed eventually in 1984. Even though I should say they did resolve the, the issues with the leadership, they actually came to some compromises and agreements. They had a functioning unified provisional government and um, and then people started to, were able to put their energy into organizing in the ways they saw fit once again. And I think it's important to note, um, and this is what Chokwe Lumumba told me when I interviewed him, New African organization, New African people's organization is not something that represents a split from the PGRNA as much as it is, he understood it as a sister organization alongside the provisional government and a political party that could participate in the movement as a party as opposed to a provisional government, right? And so, so they were able to resolve the conflicts even though on the surface, it might look as though they went their separate ways. And, um, you know, Chokwe Lumumba and, and others who went into the New African People's Organization, even if they were never part of the provisional government, they, they did continue to participate in activities with the provisional government, including New African Nation Days and a number of other functions. How did the FBI and other federal agencies classify the Republic of New Africa and its members over the years? Um, well, they have a black hate group file. <laughs> so in the, in, the, uh, in the FBI documents that I've seen, they were classified similar to Martin Luther King, the Black Panther Party, Malcolm X, and, and the other big names that we're probably aware of. They were understood as a black hate group and they were treated as such. Uh, the, the, in some instances, they were classified as terrorists. And, and I can tell you quickly about one. Uh, in 1981, there was a, an expropriation of an armored truck that did not go very well. It led to um, uh, several people, it led to a shootout mm -hmm. and several police officers were killed in the process. And because that particular group was a part of the New African independence movement, was a, associated with the Black Liberation Army and even had some white revolutionaries participating, right? Former Weather Underground folks. Um, they were understood to be a terrorist cell, I think would be the best description. And several of the people who were captured were, including uh, uh, Mutulu Shakur, who's still in prison, were convicted of RICO conspiracy charges and things of that nature, if, if not murder, because of the deaths of some of the uh, armored car personnel. And just to make the Mississippi connection real quick, uh, Fulani Sunni Ali was said to have been a part of this broader conspiracy. And she, at the time, was living in uh, Gauman, Mississippi, with a couple of other people, including her father, her elderly father, and a number of children, their property was raided and everybody from the elder to babies who couldn't even have handcuffs on them were all arrested. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's the classification. And also um, just, it, it reinforces what I was trying to say earlier about the, just the significant consequences of trying to live according to these ideals when, when things go wrong. We are almost out of time, but there are two questions that I think you can answer pretty quickly. One is uh, where the Shokwe Lumumba papers are now, if they have been deposited anywhere, or if the family still has them.
Oh, okay. I can ask. Uh, I thought you could give me them both. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I I don't have access to that information. And then Shane Peterson asks, what role did Natchez play in this movement, if any? Nat, like Natchez, Miss, uh, Mississippi. Mississippi. Well, I guess so there were deacons for um, yeah. defense and, yeah. Um, I, trying to recall, there were, yeah. I don't, I don't want to make stuff up. I can say, read Akinyele Umoja's book. Um, we will shoot back. He does talk about those connections right. and I'm just drawing blanks right now. So yeah. Yeah. I'll have to refer you to that. No, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Um, but we have come a little past the top of the hour. It moves quickly on these programs, but, uh, this is